Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for producing this huge turnout. I'm really happy to have all of you here. Um, this morning, we're going to predict the future. And we've got several techniques I'm going to explain on how we're going to do that together with our panel, whom I'm also going to introduce in a second to all of you. But before I do, I'd like to give you just a bit of context on where you are. Um, this is IX showcase for Meeting of the Future. Meeting of the Future is a, um, an IAC project that's been going on for several years now. It involves doing extensive research on what meeting planners and what the meeting industry thinks is going to happen in the next couple of years. Roughly between three and five years is the, uh, is the time frame. All of that produces a lot of data, and that data is in the report. We've got some data sheets here for you with the outcome of the research that uh, we're happy to, to hand out to you. Um, and in the showcase, we're actually going to try and take it one step further. So if these are the trends. How are we going to shape those trends? How are these trends going to impact on all of us? Um, what sort of meaning can we give to those trends? Are there any of these trends that we don't want and that we actually would like to curb? Um, that's what we're going to explore this morning. And um, we're going to focus this morning on one of the main themes in the Meeting Room of the Future Research, which is how are meeting venues going to change? And my name is Mike van der Vijver. I'm, I'm going to facilitate this session and the panel discussion. And I'll explain in a second how we're going to do that. Um, we're going to use Slido. For those of you who are not familiar with it yet, you can either look it up in the conference app or you can just surf say, uh, simply to the slido.com website. And there, if you tap IAC meeting room, you will get the questions. But that's going to be only towards the end. The main thing we're going to focus on, what is the future for meeting and conference venues and spaces? What, is, what needs to change? What is already changing? What are those environments going to look like? What will venues need more of that they don't have today, or less of that they have today? OK? Um, and as I said, this is looking into the future. Um, I don't have the crystal ball, but I do have three other techniques that the panel are going to use. Um, I also skipped a number of possible techniques, like one of them, and very interesting technique would have been silomancy. Um, which is when you burn wood and look at the ashes <laughs> to predict the future. I think MPI wouldn't have been very happy with this. No. Um, another one is called uh, osteomancy, where you throw bones in the air and you look at what they, what they look like, and on the basis of that, you predict the future. Centuries, actually millions of, uh, thousands of years old, but we didn't want to do that one. And the other one is called uh, haromancy, and that one was really unsustainable because it involves looking at the innards of animals. <laughs> So we thought that that wasn't really very nice for this session. Instead, we're going to start off with tarot cards. OK, so we're going to have the panel look at the tarot cards. And on the basis of that, they're going to predict the future for you. Let me introduce the panel to you, three very distinguished specialists on this. We've got Gail, Mc Gail McLeese, who is in Densler Design. She designs meeting spaces. She's going to talk a lot about the impact of the physical environment that people are in on their behavior. Uh, we've got Alan Boost, our guest speaker from Deloitte University. Um, you had a really beautiful definition for your role within Deloitte. It's simply advisory. Advisory? It's a great title. Advisory. <laughs> yeah, so he advises anybody, whether they want to or not, right? Uh, they have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got with us Alan Sinclair, who's the vice president of Benchmark, global hospitality company, which um, is deeply involved with IAC. So we're all set. Let's get going. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, first uh, Gail to talk us to us on the basis of the cards. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm the medium, obviously, um, you understand, as the facilitator. So I'm going to lay out the four cards, five cards for you. You can eliminate one card, and then we'll see what happens. So here are the five cards. Could you please come forward and turn them around, All right. and then eliminate the one card you don't want? So what have we got here? I have Ace of Wands. The Ace of Wands, the Emperor. Emperor, the Star. Okay. The Magician. The Magician. I like that one. And the Ace, Ace of Cups. Cups. Okay, which is the one that you don't want? I do not want. Let's do the Emperor. Okay, we eliminate the Emperor. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you see in the other four cards? Please tell us. Oh my. All right. I see. I see. 
a lot of sensory and a lot of stimulation here. I see that uh, we are going to be providing a lot of digital experience design in the future with our meeting spaces and combining those senses with the magician. Uh -huh. So You've got the magician and the ace of wands. Absolutely. There you are. Perfect. <laughs> meeting, so magic. You, meeting magic, yes. So you can make meeting magic meeting by providing magic. Digital, digital experiences. Yes, digital experience design is, um, you know, it's, it's part of our future. We have we have um, sensory stimulation within uh, spaces, but it's going to be taken in the future uh, digitally. So we can have these immersive experiences that uh, your whole ballroom could be designed as a digital experience, not just one screen. So we have this immersive uh, capability with the magician. And uh, they will be able to, um, you can take yourself to Bali if you'd like. You can have an experience in, um, let's say, in China if you'd like to. So depending on where your uh, meeting space is, you can have that digital experience um, displayed throughout, this, throughout the space. And also, we can take it, our senses a little bit further and include um, sensory design, which would include uh, music, also aromatherapy. So if you want a spa type setting, we could have that spa, that little scene from the ocean in our, in our meeting rooms, and you can import a scent from the future. And then you can just have this total immersive experience of where you are or where you want to be. Mm, where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Where would you think that people in, let's say, Deloitte would want to be? They would want to be uh, with their clients. Can, we, can you make clients? With sure. Digital experience? We can make any kind of client we'd like, yes. Yeah. And you can, you can, can you pre-program the clients? A bit like Sims, sort of? Could you do Sims with clients? Sure. Oh. We could do some artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. too. We could pre-program the, the experience towards your client. And um, actually, whatever your client is offering could be displayed on, the, on these digital experiences as well. If it's a food product, you could import the scent. If it's a... If it's a sensory product, you could um, have that stimulation of texture around you, or you could also have, like we've talked about before, some type of visual aspect of for your client. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Gail. So that's the first possible <laughs> development in the future. Um, let me turn, what was the, oh, these are some of the examples that you had. Yes, yeah. this is a, for a confidential client where um, We've designed this ballroom in China that we're talking about this immersive experience. This is more tech oriented. But as you can see, you can pretty much um, digitalize anything and um, create this whole immersive experience within your ballroom. And we're not talking one panel, we're talking the whole entire space. Yeah. So. OK. Alan, let me, let me lay out the cards for okay. you so that you can, you can have your go. Okay, so here's one, two, three, four, five. Here you go. So we have to have a look. Let's see. I shovel them. <laughs> we have the magician is back. We have the star. The ace of wands is back. Are, are you sure you didn't deal off the bottom of the deck? I'm, I'm cheating. Sure I'm did. cheating. I'm cheating. Wait, There's wait, a wait, full wait. house over yeah, here. Yeah, right? This is not good. <laughs> Well, Keep your eye on him because I think he's got a couple up here too. That's our future, the magician and the wand. Okay. And the star. I kind of like the star. See if you can yeah. bring that one. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Oh, great, we have death. Death is the first one. Very good. And the page of swords, the tower, temperance. Oh, that's always relevant to a meeting. Um, and the Hierophant, which we're not entirely sure what the Hierophant is. I'm going to keep that one. I think death we might set aside for the moment. You don't want death? No, we don't want you death. You sure? You don't want to get rid of something? You know, at, in, in my events, generally, we avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> if it shows up in the design, I usually catch it. Um, okay. So in terms of what does this tell me uh, around what's coming in the future? Um, so the Page of Swords is an interesting one because it's, it's sort of sitting here with like a sword, with, you know, right, right, like, a, like it's a cricket bat or a baseball bat, and it's about to level something. And then we have the Tower, which has got this sound and fury coming out of it. And then next to it, we have this really sort of placid, you know, temperance, which, you know, she's pouring, you know, water from one goblet to another. And so the reason, and then 
the Hierophant, which is this mystical character, and we actually don't know what he is or what he does. <laughs> Um, what does this tell me? This tells me that there's actually a storyline. And so uh, the, the, the first sort of trend on this is up, up until now, I'm going to take my seat again. I don't yeah, want to yeah. be sort of towering over you. Um, you know, up until now, producing either learning events or, you know, events of any kind has been this sort of, you know, putting together of two worlds, right? There's sort of what the event organizer, what the sponsor is trying to do, and then there's this sort of whole event machinery trying to make it happen. And there's this like guessing game, right? And so those of you who sort of, do, I know you all do this for a living, it's like, you know, here's what we want to do. Well, that's not really what I wanted. And this like, this thing goes back and forth. And so the reason I touch on the storyline is that actually, in, in my view, that is the, the major trend <coughs> of the future is, 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 is for, you know, event owner and event producer to become the same person. Right, so that's kind of the magician putting stuff together. Perhaps this is what the hierophant does. I'm not sure, <laughs> um, but what this means is, you know, uh, when we're going to sort of work with a meeting planner and we're going to work with a site, the first step is to understand what's the storyline. Like I'm trying to tell a story with what's going on here, and it is the content, but it is everything else that goes into it. And what goes into it needs to be consistent with what that storyline is. And if it's inconsistent. Or if, you know, in the middle of it, something happens that I wasn't expecting, it means that somewhere along the line, we didn't actually understand what the story was. So that's my first sort of prediction, is that uh, event sponsors, particularly if it's a learning event or a congress of some sort, there is an overall story they're trying to tell. And if you find yourself in the position of having to produce this and you have not asked the first question, which is, what's your objective for this and what story are you trying to tell? then you will be re reacting all the way through. You'll be trying to guess what it is they're trying to do. That's a lot of energy getting spent, and it, and it increases the risk of error a lot, right? And, you know, in this world, you know, error ends up with, you know, disagreement and dissension, and, you know, it's kind of not what people want. So that's my, my sort of first sort of prediction is um, that event sponsors will become more, their, their expectations will rise a lot. They're, they're high right now. I think they'll become higher. That the, that the sites they're working with and the planners they're working with will actually understand their story and then will contribute to it, right? Okay. And so that's, I think, something to bear in mind. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So that were the tarot cards. Now let's move to a different technique for Ellen. <laughs> We've got... He turned up death and that yeah. put him off, <laughs> put put him off the whole We've thing. We've moved on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so here, okay. this we're is, gonna, this is another age-old way of telling the future. Yeah. It's called rhabdomancy. You drop the sticks, and the person who uh, predicts the future is going to read into the sticks what's going to happen. So, Ellen, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we are. These are, by the way, these are original Canadian sticks. I didn't import <laughs> these. Didn't import these from Europe because, as Alan said, I would I would end up in prison. Ready? Oh, okay. the One's little, on the floor. The little oh. stick fell. A off. sign. <laughs> Uh, talking about uh, the future and talking about how we produce events, event experiences, this is perfectly in line with where we're going. Disparate pieces coming together to make a beautiful picture, as you, as you see overall. It has its own personality. Every time you look at an event and look at uh, something like this with the sticks, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder, but as a whole, it makes a beautiful um, um, ex e e e sensory experience, as Gail was saying. Um, I think in the future, that's exactly where we need to go. We've seen that um, starting to move in that direction, where our venue planners are becoming really uh, event experience planners. They're not just uh, dates and rates and the process. Um, we're working together, we're looking to the future, to have that be a more collaborative uh, environment, uh, just as Alan was saying, so that that uh, primary objective of the meeting planner is achieved. And how that happens locally and with uh, both uh, the, the um, client's goals and objectives, but also the individual's uh, goals and objectives. It's focused on connecting the um, uh, the attendee, the delegate, with the client brand and experience, 
but it's also how can our meetings help to transform the individual. Um, and I think this kind of shows that. Every, everyone's different. Everyone's coming to an event mm. and experience with uh, their own uh, needs and their own vision of what's going on. But if we uh, collaborate effectively uh, with the client to understand their objectives, understand the demographics of the environment, I think that's our future because uh, our most valuable uh, commodity if we're talking about sustainability is time, something that you can't replace. And the price value of time um, is something in the future that we need to collaborate on. The, the client, the venue, and you know, we also, as the venue, as the experience maker, has to have um, a, a, f a bucket full of uh, local contacts. So it can be a, a local event, so you have a sense of place when you're there, that you can um, also have a content driver, someone who says, okay, this is your objective, this is the space we have to work with, how are we going to create that? And uh, the venue operators having those sorts of connections it's kind of like um, Match.com, bringing the, the right people together at the right time to uh, make that event successful for not only the client but each individual delegate. So I can see you've got, you've got sort of you've got the, the tall and skinny participant. Right. You've got the <laughs> well, that's short, the whole food and beverage short thing. and <laughs> stocky participant. You've got, you've got the schizophrenics here. Isn't it? But what we yeah. also have is the one on the floor. The one on the floor. <laughs> right, yeah. Make it in. And <laughs> that's, that's the problem. The, and this, that's, that's what we need to work on to make sure that he stays on the table. You can't it. forget his needs as well. Even got though it. he's some sort of outlier, he's still a delegate <laughs> that needs to be addressed. Yeah. In our, in our, in our uh, exploratory talks, you, you, you mentioned this as that the, um, the venues need event experience managers inside. Mm -hmm. how, how do you envisage the development of such a professional figure? Um, I think that's it's already started mm. because in, in conferencing, uh, working with clients, you uh, understand uh, what they're looking for, their, their goals and objectives, and then when you take it to, uh, okay, uh, this is my venue, I know what works very well in my venue, I've seen what's worked for others with similar objectives. So they become experts by experience. And I think that's something that we as event operators, uh, venue operators creating events, are focused on now to give our, um, our staff, our planners, the uh, education, the exposure, coming to events like this where you can experience what other people are doing. It's not put your head down and sell what's on a menu. Um, a, lot of menu a lot of venues don't even have menus any longer. You create the menu together. And I think that's definitely a way of the future. There's not one uh, size fits all. Okay, thank you. So you already have three major things that we see happening in the future, right? So one is about experience design. The other is about clarity on the, on the narrative, which is based on objectives that Alan mentioned, and the cooperation between venues and uh, their clients on that. And the third is a specific figure that you will need and that is developing already, which is an internal experience, uh, an experience manager, event experience manager. Okay, who has a question on any of these three trends? I've got a mic. Yes. Excuse me. What sorts of uh, spaces do you see as being used in some of the venues that you've talked about, or some of the experiences that you've talked about? What what kind of uh, space would us uh, meeting planners be looking for to create the kinds of experiences that you've mentioned? Just as in as in a physical space. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think, as as Gail mentioned, uh, the the meeting room, uh, what we've discovered through all of our research over the mm -hmm. last few years, meeting room of the future is not a room. <laughs> yeah. Meetings happen everywhere. Every time that you get people together for whatever <laughs> purpose, whether it's 2,000 or two people, it's, it's an event and it needs to be an experience. Mm -hmm. So flexibility, uh, we need to have uh, natural light. Right. Uh, you, natural light. Natural light is, uh, is I mean, we all, we all want to be part of nature, right? And we all want to feel um, part of nature and so it's like an innate need that we have we don't want to be stuck in a meeting room so we see all of our meeting rooms now having 
windows. So uh, it's very important. All of our new, new uh, um, we're designing projects together, <laughs> Ellen and I, and all of our meeting rooms now um, are have windows, right? So so it's part of that feeling that you get. And so uh, you know, I, I I encourage all of you to really think about how your um, how your staff and how your uh, delegates feel in these spaces and how you want them to feel. So really plan for that experience, and that's what makes you an experienced event manager. And Good. part of the, um, the changing the process uh, that, that we were chatting about mm -hmm. and becoming collaborative is to ensure that um, the, the environment is uh, not causing stress. So it depends on the type of meeting, the individuals there. The practices that we use together needs to de-stress the situation. Mm -hmm. So the in environment, whether it's ch being able to choose the chair that you feel comfortable in, um, but that now expands to the total environment um, the, and all the elements of it. So creating that experience. There's no one, one again, no one fits all. Um, mm -hmm. But having it flexible and having a space that's transformable to what you need is absolutely the way in the future. And I know we're stuck on uh, hard goods, but you know, every, people are comfortable sitting on the floor. <laughs> so what's your breakout? Go out and sit on the lawn. Mm -hmm. You know, it's there's so many different options now, and being able to be prepared to deal with those sorts of things, and the schedule changing a la minute because it feels the the the, the uh, leader of the pack here for the meeting. The sense is something going on with the delegates, so it's like, well, let's change it up. And the mm -hmm. operator got to be flexible to change that, whether it's physical space or timing or whatever else it might be. Mm -hmm. And go on the expectation that there will be a need to move quickly from large discussion, somewhat one-sided, to small discussion, interactive, and back. Mm -hmm. And that means things like walls that move really quickly, mm -hmm. right? Open and close, no problem or that they have access to places where they can have a small conversation and then really quickly come back and make some sense of that in a large group. That kind of seamlessness is actually the way stuff is going. Mm -hmm. And the third one is go on the expectation that someone who is not a delegate may need to have access to what's going on in there. So, you know, we talked when we began, you asked the question, you know, what what kind of simulation would Deloitte want? Actually, Deloitte would want the ability to plug its clients into what's going on with its mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And so that may mean that people who are actually not ca caught in your registration and people mm -hmm. who do not have your app need to be able to connect to some space in your site or in your event so they can see and hear what's going on, give feedback to it, or otherwise contribute. And that's you know a, a growing trend and actually very important for us mm -hmm. from a learning perspective. Okay, and great, not thanks. sitting on a conference call. Yeah, it's, no conference it's calls. It's got to feel inclusive. Yeah, the technology is going to help us get there. Yeah. yeah, I hope. We hope. OK, more questions? Okay, there was an interesting detail in the in the research report where, for the first time, uh, respondents preferred daylight over good screen view. Because <laughs> there there appears to be uh, a, a bit of a mismatch between the two. The more daylight you have, the more unlikely it is that you have good screen view. And in the past, delegates would always, in the in the majority, um, favor good view on screens. As a result of events becoming more experiential, you have less need for screens because you, you want the people. You want to have the, the people doing the event. Mm -hmm. And so having daylight for the people is becoming more important. So it's a, it's a detail, but it's an, an interesting shift in the, that we see in the research outcomes. And thank goodness technology, technology. is keeping ahead of us. Right. Technology well, is better, sharper yeah. uh, uh, vision right. in highlight. Um, and the other thing, as we all are experiencing, is acoustics. Right. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with the whole acoustics problem, which we're hoping our experts are going to help us do that as well. <laughs> OK. Gail, are you ready? Sure. Because we're moving to your second <laughs> vision of the future. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you want to make sure there's no. Ooh, uh, nice. Oh, that looks totally different. It doesn't it. And no outline. All the sticks stayed on the table. And there's a oh, there's a bug. And there's a bug as well. <laughs> it's like an infiltrator. In yes. The hmm. I like it. That is definitely a different photo, a different picture, a different experience, right? And so that's like a variety. So that's telling me that there's going to, uh, you know, there's a need for variety, as we talked about, all of us. 
that um, our venues should have, and you know, flexibility is a spice of a meeting, really. So um, we all talk about, you know, how I talk. I keep telling you about senses because I'm a sensory designer, and um, I really believe that if you feel good in a space, you're going to be more productive. You're going to come back. You're going to remember the event. So it's really all about that wellness factor that you that that you have for a delegate or and or people that are running this event. This is you know these events are tiring. <laughs> so there's a lot of there's a lot of it takes a village, right? So keeping the venue um, in that wellness aspect and uh, really really giving that diversity of feelings. Um, so you could sit on a sofa, you could sit on the floor, you could experience nature, you could sit by a biophilic wall. So you could really, um, you know, have all these different experiences within one space. And what Elle was talking about, being able to break break down, you know, compress and decompress, and, and being able to have all of this available for you in, in these meetings in, in the future are is just pretty much how events are gonna be running. Um, you know, nobody wants to sit in a dark room anymore. Uh, you know, all, bar, all ballrooms we're designing with uh, windows now as well because of technology letting us, t uh, you know, be able to have these big screens that have this definition that you don't really need a blacked out, a, a totally blacked out space. So um, I see variety as just, you know, continuing to get to be more and more important and for everyone and that wellness factor again just really think about you know your event what you're trying to achieve the food is part of it sustainability is part of it you know your visual aspect what you hear what you see what you smell all of those really make a, for a good event and so just being aware of those situations and being aware of your senses and your, your client senses um, I think are just going to be more and more impactful in the future mm. as we, um, you know, collab collaborate with, uh, you know, owners and and operators and designers and all of us thinking about this. And the future is just going to make for a better, more versatile event. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think these sticks are <laughs> they're beginning to lose their power. <laughs> so let's clear them out. Um, We've got somebody who will hoover this away later. <laughs> so, and let's turn to our last and most powerful way of predicting the future. Coffee. Ready? I I'm all set. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you are. Alan? Ah. Your second point. Read the coffee, please. Read in the in coffee. Britain, they do it with so tea the, the, the first thing I noticed, the first thing I noticed is that the coffee actually is used. Um, I wasn't anticipating that. I thought it might, you know, spread around a little bit more. Um, actually, there's a couple of there's a couple of thoughts come out of this one, and the first is, what happens with the coffee when we're done with it? Our delegates actually ask; they want to know. And the younger they are, the more important it is to them. And for us, when we're uh, when we're putting when we're putting any kind of event or any kind of uh, conference or learning on, it has to flow into what's important to us as an organization. And so it actually goes, we, we've talked a little bit around, you know, making sure you understand the objectives. It actually goes a little deeper than that. Um, because, um, you know, if I put on the lens of an event sponsor or a program owner or something like that, I, I actually want you to be part of the conversation, right? So, you know, in my experience, a lot of meeting planners will hold back because they're waiting to be told, what do I want? And I, I, I don't know, right? I actually don't know. But what will happen and the danger you face is I actually do know what I want, but it's stuck in the back of my head along with the meaning that I'm ascribing to all the things that I'm coming up with. And if you don't inquire into that, you're running the risk that you know, something will come up that I didn't want. And you know, if, if only you could have read my mind. Well, so I'm going to suggest to you a question that you should be asking. And it goes beyond objectives, right? So, you know, what are your objectives? That's easy to ask, and you'll get, you know, you know s so that everyone learns something. I'm going to suggest that you inquire into the meaning of things. So it's one thing to cascade goals. It's another thing to cascade meaning. 
And so uh, I, I really like it, and I find it takes my events and my, and my programs to a higher level. If the meeting planner and the, and the site ask me, how is this important to you, right? So I'll say, it, you know, the dinner has to end at, you know, 6.30. Well, ask me how that's important to me, and then you'll find out exactly what the real meaning is for this stuff. Once you've found out what meaning I'm ascribing to all of the things that we say we want, then you're in a position to give me a point of view. Right? Then you can actually come and say, okay, well, actually, I know what this site can do. I know what my local market can do. I know I have my own experience as a planner. If that's the meaning of this stuff, here's, some, here's here are two or three things that you actually might not have thought of that would actually help me take it to a place where, with your expertise, I could get it. I don't have the expertise. That's why I'm working with you. So, you know, when we talk about here, you can see some stuff that I talked about. This is, you know, uh, from competent order takers to developing solutions. It goes beyond solutions and it goes to experience. But the experience I'm looking for is rooted in meaning. So I guess my advice to you and the trend of the future, if you want to stay ahead and sort of stand out as a great site or a great meeting planner, inquire into the meaning of what we're doing. Because then every moment along the way, you will have a point of view as to how we could engineer that. And then that is a true partnership. You're actually bringing me a point of view. But if you wait to be told what to do, then you run the risk that I actually didn't know enough to tell you wisely, and then we're going to have moments. OK, so you want, you want a proactive venue? That's I, I, want a, I want a curious venue. OK. Right? I want a venue that's actually curious about why we're doing this, curious about how this links to what Deloitte is trying to do, curious about the meaning of, of having people come there. Why did you choose the people you chose? What's the meaning for them? What do you want them leaving with? And you know, how is that important to you? And then that gives me more to work with when I come back and I help you put together a really good experience, be it from the site's perspective or from the planner's perspective. Is that kind of a, a mix between being a specialist on, on putting on meetings and being a journalist? Well, a specialist in putting meetings together, uh, when I say, you know, he, here's a meeting for 100 people and they need to have three meals and it can't cost more than, you know, 200 bucks a person, it's like, okay, I can do that. But I don't know if that's what you actually need. Hmm. Right? Why, why, why are you having the meeting? Well, I really want them to get to know each other as a team. How is that important? Well, because they've never worked together before and they have a big, you know, there's a big sort of initiative, kind of like whatever it is. Like, okay, fine. There's some moments we can do with your meals. There's some moments we can do with the arrival experience. There's some moments we can do in the evening. If you hadn't inquired into what the meeting was, you, you wouldn't know how to imagine that. Yeah. yeah. So it's beyond proactive, it's, it's curious. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Anything to add to that? No? In, in um, eliminating some of the mechanics yeah. and going to the yeah. actual results, yeah. we, as operators, you have to have a process to do what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and that sort of thing. But it has to be relevant. Each one of those elements need to come together. And I think uh, just like the meeting room of the future isn't really a room, the meeting goes beyond the time that you're together in the space. It's, there's got to be pre and there's got to be post, or your time in the middle can be devalued. So um, working with a content expert, working with someone who can then help to increase the value of the time spent is so important. It also helps to de-stress the attendee because they know what to expect when they're coming through that pre-information of whatever form. So I think it all, it's, it's not just a finite time period. I think it's a continuum that needs to be addressed. Great, thank you. Okay, let's put this back in. In, I said. Oh, my comment about my comment about the coffee. Our delegates actually do want to know the story on this stuff, right? So when you're putting stuff together, what's happened to the wasted food and how much there was? They actually want to know. I, I want to know because I'm going to get asked, right? So people leave a buffet and half of it's still there. They want to know where it went and what it was used for. Hmm. Um, and, and the other comment... This uh, comes from the kitchen in yes, the hotel. I, in the hotel I well. <laughs> recognize that. Um, but but the, 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 the other thing on that is um, help us to tell the story around what actually went into the meeting itself. Because everyone has this you know, thing at the end where it's like, you know, let's, let's applaud the, you know, the production crew. Great moment. It's, it's actually kind of expected. But if we have a story to tell around what actually went into the production and what sort of the impact was of it on the hotel or on the number of people who worked there, like a little bit of that, people like to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then anything that has to do either with food or the environment, go on the assumption that people want way more information on demand than they've ever got before, right? 
So, you know, interesting, today I came and I had to go and register up here, and there are all these little cards out that they'll give to people, right? One says kosher, and the other says, you know, allergies and all this kind of stuff. And it's like that's, you know, somehow unwelcome. And we have to go out of our way to kind of accommodate that. It would be much better if when I came and saw a food thing, there was something that was like a standard thing, which is, you know, this is okay for these diets, and this has this stuff in it. It's a little bit of it is here. But, you know, that's just a different way to approach it. But the difference is it's not we're kind of, you know, going out of our way to, you know, include people who, you know, can't eat everything. It's like, no, we've already figured a way to make them feel inclusive. It, 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 isn't, it isn't an exception. We're, we, we, we were ready for you, right? And my comment up there around registration, I, I don't want my people lining up. So what I'm looking for is advice on how we can get them to the point that they are credentialed and in, a room, and in a room where the experience is something way different. Put the registration in their room. Send it to them in advance. Put it on their phone. That kind of stuff. Anything that sort of takes the feeling of, you know, customs and immigration away. That's, that's kind of, you know, the trend we're looking for. <laughs> Thank you very much. As, as a foreigner coming to North America, I'd be very much I in know favor exactly of that. I exactly what yeah. you went <laughs> Okay. Are you ready, Alan, for your last turn? I'm going to make my hands dirty now to do it better. Oh. There you are. Wow. <laughs> Looks like the end of the conference. <laughs> Very interesting that what you've created for us here, or what the coffee has created for us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it uh, continues the conversation about where it came, what it did while it was there, and then where is it going? Uh, where is it taking what its, what its uh, purpose is uh, away from its, its one purpose? What can it do in its next life and the next generation? and uh, leading to how do we continue the momentum of the meeting, but also how do you address sustainability? Um, the um, the uh, comments that Alan was making about where does the food go afterwards and how do you uh, satisfy each individual? We've talked a lot about allergies this morning. The chefs have some great suggestions here. But you know, my hope for the future is that the food that we're serving is going to satisfy everyone. So you have less need for allergies. Uh, there are vendors now in, in food production. I uh, uh, don't know if any of you have run, ever run into Farmer Lee Jones. If you don't know him, Google him. He's great. Uh, uh, blue overalls and a red bow tie is all he ever wears. He says he has 18 of them in his closet, whether it's a wedding or whatever. And his family is now third and fourth generation of producing wonderful vegetables. And it's all about um, utilizing things that are appropriate to the land and producing things that are uh, valuable, um, providing nutrition, et cetera. It's, um, and in our story of the, um, the survey results, there are two questions about sustainability. There was one that said sustainability practices are important to you, and it got like a, a 40%. It, there was also a question that said ethical practices and sustainability are important to you. It's got, it got higher than 80%. So I think it's more about the ethics of how you're doing your business, the products that we employ, the, the techniques that we change, our food production, so that, you know, as, as Murray and Felix were talking about, the product it satisfies everyone. You don't, I think Murray said, no one says which has gluten. <laughs> but if you don't have gluten, then it covers everyone. So the, and if you're eating um, great, great product from seed to service, uh, as Farmer Jones does, the allergies are going to go away too. We're not going to be dealing 10 years from now with everybody being allergic to this and that because as a child you will have been eating non-chemical, that sort of thing. So that's my prediction for the future is that we're going to be smart enough to take advantage of the companies that have ethical practices, that do things right, that have a culture of community to be able to deliver this experience in a different way. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Who has a question on these Two, these three, uh, three next trends that we've heard. One is about wellness, the other is about much more uh, Q 
curious venues who get interested into the story, the story that your client is telling. And the third one is sustainability. Yes. That's okay. You can backpedal. It's Dove's tails and all of it, but I'm just wondering this idea of being flexible and changing things on the fly. I wonder how do you empower the boots on the ground to do that? Because it is a risk to make a decision during an event and then feel there might be repercussions after. So how do you empower those people to be able to have that flexibility? Yeah. That answer's a good one for you, I think. Sure. Um, I think it's the culture of what you create within your environment and how you engage your staff to be empowered to take care of what the customer needs are. First of all, you've got to provide them with the right tools and equipment and knowledge, uh, but we're in the meetings business. Things change a la minute, we're dealing with people. So that's, uh, I think, a, a foundation of what you're doing. And if a meeting planner has a change, they feel the vibe is wrong and they go to our floor manager and says, okay, we've got to change something up, the team just, does it because it's what the client needs to kind of to Alan's uh, point. Are we on? Oh, there we go. Um, this needs to be a conversation that kind of starts from the moment you get the idea to have the event until everybody went home, right? Because it is improv. We all know this, right? Like you rehearse your scene, but you play the one you're given. So, um, you know, if, if, if you. If, I guess I'm, I'm, the, the, word imp the, the word empowered sort of confused me a little bit because I think it's more understanding who actually can have that conversation. So if on the way in you anticipate that there's going to be moments where your people, the, either the production group or the venue or some combination of it, is going to be asked to do something they hadn't anticipated, I think, I think having a conversation with the, with the ultimate sponsor on what are the limits on that and how ought that to work, I think that you know, makes it a lot more predictable, right? Because at least in our in our world, any one of my partners could come and say that they wanted the bar to be open until six in the morning, and you know I've learned that I have a conversation with the crew in advance to say when you get a request like that, here's where it goes, here's here's the people who need to be part of it, and that's when we'll decide. But what we absolutely do not want is someone to say, well, I'm holding it at fifty-five dollars a person and not a penny more, so the answer is no. No, 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 no. Come and have the conversation with us. It may be that that leads to the outcome we were looking for, and we're good with it. We need to have the conversation. It's and, and sometimes, yeah, Alan, Adam, go ahead. Uh, interesting that Alan's uh, comment. One of the things that we started uh, actually a number of years ago when we first opened Deloitte University yeah. in, in Dallas is we teach our people, we put them through an improv class, all of our employees. Yeah. We did it with the yeah. front of the house staff, and then the back of the house staff said, and we, because we thought people were going to be terrified to have to stand up and do improv. The back of the house people came and said, well, how come we're not going to that training? Uh, because it was a, a badge of honor and it teaches people to be yeah. comfortable yeah. with the unknown. And yeah. it's, it's because it's what we live every day. And, uh, and uh, a really smart idea, get like a slide with the people who are actually have roles to play with their <laughs> pictures on it and have even a 20 minute with like the whole crew Here's who's running it, here's the meeting planner, here are the people who can decide, and here are their names, and it's a really good idea if you watch for them and you know, just like even use their name. Like that whole experience, just you could you can charge another 20% more and we'll pay it because it feels like we're in that 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 partnership and that you know integrated conversation that we're looking for. Yeah. And, and sometimes the solution is you know embarrassingly simple. So, um, as, a, as a moderator or facilitator, I just ask the delegates to do it. You need to sit differently. Okay, pick up a chair and go and sit in groups of four. You don't have to, you know, have to crew in and do it uh, all very complicated. And then afterwards, you tell them, "Could you put please the sort of seats back?" Done. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, my question was just um, maybe how to incorporate um, sense sensory experiences Closer. and sustainability um, on little to no budget. Um, what kinds of things can you do? Do you have some ideas? Mm -hmm. I heard you say design doesn't have to be super expensive, so that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. No, it doesn't. Um, I, I think that I think if you you can do something like um, an aromatherapy type, you know. Uh, 
a program within a space, and I think you know that that's not that expensive if you're if you're trying to do something like that. Um, I think that it's you know the props that you have. I think it's the variety, the seating. I've been in I've been in situations before where we've pulled chairs out of different meeting rooms just to make that experience right. So it's just being able to, to know um, what's available and switching it around so that way you don't have to actually you know purchase things you can just go to um, you know a different office or a different a different space within the within the um, hotel and pull things out even I've done it before with presidential suites you know you have, there's a there's a really great sofa up there and it's not being used right now so you pull it down but it just it's just trying to think of different ways that you can um, that you can utilize everything that you have in a hotel to create that experience. So just from a, an operator perspective, um, we have a menu of things that you could do. And uh, having those resources, for example, you mentioned aromatherapy. One of our providers of guest amenities, soaps and that sort of thing, will come and do an essential oil uh, testing where you can create your own essential oil. No money, no right. cost. Wow. Um, you can do a uh, fitness break. Someone from the, the spa fitness center come in yep. uh, to yep. do yep. a 15 minute whatever. Yeah. No money. It's, it's not a, a big deal, but it changes yeah. your perspective and your environment. Right. Okay. Little, so, breaks, okay, little breaks of like mindfulness. La last comment because okay. we're, we're getting we're flooded getting, away. We're getting flooded. Taken over. Acoustically. <laughs> so uh, just on, on, on Ellen's point, you can get to uh, different solutions than you anticipated if you expand the question to people who don't normally get asked, right? So it would be really, and one of the things that, it doesn't happen very often with us, but I love it when it does, is when we're having a planning discussion around how, the, how a large event's gonna work, I have someone there from housekeeping, and I have someone there from maintenance, and I have someone there from, you know, the, 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 the chef is there. Parts of the operation that are normally not asked to contribute a point of view, you would be amazed at what they know, and you would be amazed at suggestions they may have that would give an, an opportunity you hadn't even thought about. So, you know, the cheapest, and in fact it's free, ask those who are not normally asked what their thinking is. You can come up with something and it'll be free. Let's make uh, virtue out of necessity and do something silent here <laughs> so that we don't, we don't have to talk. Um, could we have the question for the word cloud up, please? We'll skip the, uh, the previous question because that requires talking. Um, if you go to Slido now, um, you will see, if all is well when you open it, you will see a screen where you can just type in a word. And we will create together with the group a word cloud. And the word cloud is, in one word, what is your main takeaway of this session? Okay, so use your phone, type in your solution, and we will see what it is that together you think you have learned. As you type it up, you will see them coming up. The bigger they are, the more popular they are. And you can influence each other, by the way. Okay, anybody still typing? Raise your hand, please, if you are. But then you can type. <laughs> so it's a bit of a stupid question. Okay, thank you very much. This is the outcome. Flexibility is the most important thing that you're going to take away, followed by experience, variety, creativity, and collaboration. Thanks for having been with us. Uh, th could I have a round of applause for the panel, please?